Welcome to this seminar on strategies for dealing with FMLA abuse. My name is Rebecca Shanlever. I'll be your presenter today. I am a labor and employment attorney with Hall, Arbery, Gilligan, Roberts, and Shanlever in Atlanta, Georgia. First, we'll just go over quickly some of the topics that we're going to cover in this seminar. I'd like to go over, begin to begin, a quick refresher on what employees' rights and responsibilities are under the FMLA. Most folks who are attending this presentation probably know a lot about the FMLA, and that's why you're here to, uh, listening to this seminar. But I, I think it's helpful to go through some of the basics again, just as a reminder of what the law requires uh, under the FMLA. After that, we're going to go through some real-life examples of FMLA abuse situations. These come from actual cases that have gone through the court system, from matters that I have handled for clients over the years. They are, they are actual facts that happen in actual circumstances, and they'll be helpful, I think, to help us identify the next part of our, of our seminar, which is strategies for handling and hopefully, in many cases, preventing FMLA abuse. So let's go over our refresher on FMLA rights and responsibilities. To be covered, an employee has got to have worked for you for at least a year and for a certain number of hours in the last 12 months, and also at a place where there are 50 or more employees. Some employers provide FMLA protection to every employee regardless of those location requirements, but one of the first steps to look at when you're going through this FMLA analysis is whether the FMLA even applies to this individual in the first place. So that's an important reminder. Even if the FMLA applies to you as the employer, there may be some uh, some way that the employee is not, is not covered yet or isn't covered at his or her particular location. The triggering event for most FMLA leave is a serious health condition, whether that's of an employee or of the employee's family member. It can also be triggered by the birth of a child or adoption of a child or placement of a child in foster care in the employee's home. There are also a couple of other FMLA triggers that we're not going to get into detail about here today, but just as a reminder, there are additional uh, leave circumstances that can come up for a family member, excuse me, for an employee who has a family member who has been called up to active military duty, and that's an additional amount of leave uh, above and beyond the 12 weeks. Again, we're not going to really get into that today, but it's just a reminder that it's not just a serious health condition or birth or adoption. There could be a military, uh, a military event that could occur, a deployment of an employee's family member that could trigger the right to FMLA leave. The basic leave requirement, again, is 12 weeks of leave per year. Again, that's unpaid leave, just as a reminder, but it is a full 12 weeks of leave each year. The way you calculate that year can be up to you as the employer, whether it's a calendar year or whether it's a rolling look-back period. Most of you are probably familiar with that and, and have chosen one or the other methods of calculating the year in your FMLA policy. The rights that an employee has under the FMLA are to protection of his or her job while, while he or she are out on leave and also continued health coverage while on, on leave. So the leave is the, is the first sort of right and entitlement, and then the second thing is the, the right to have your job back when you return from leave, and then sometimes forgotten is that continued health, health coverage. So what are the, some of the employees' responsibilities under the FMLA? We've talked about what their rights are, what their entitlements are. First, the employee has to provide certification as well as additional information in, in certain circumstances. This is that medical certification form that the employee's health care provider has to complete indicating the amount of leave needed, the type of leave needed, and when the leave um, you know, is expected to expire. 
that is sort of your first step and your first line of defense in, in handling FMLA issues is getting that good certification from the employee's health care provider. Another responsibility that an employee may have is to use up his or her paid vacation, sick, and other leave if the employer's FMLA policy spells that out and requires that. Why is that an important responsibility? Because if an employee is allowed to use the FMLA unpaid leave, a whole 12 weeks, and then vacation, sick, and other leave on top of that, it effectively extends that 12-week leave period to a much longer period of time. So as long as your FMLA policy requires it, uh, then an employee is required to use up that leave concurrently with the FMLA leave so that the total amount of leave, both paid and unpaid, is capped at 12 weeks. Another responsibility is for the employee to provide updates while he or she is out on leave. And that will get that can be very important as we go through these examples. We will see how those updates and periodic reports um, can be important. So next we're going to start into some of our examples. These are those real life situations we talked about that, that have come from real facts that will allow us to sort of see how these issues play out and talk about how they could have been prevented. So our first example is coincidental FMLA leave. What happens here is that at the end of the year, in early December, Adam, a plant manager, asks for vacation for the week between Christmas and New Year's. Adam hasn't been with the company very long, and others have asked for vacation that week before he did, so his supervisor denies his request. So fast forward to December 23rd, Adam calls in sick and says he needs to be out through January the 2nd. He says it's because he can't work, he's having a flare-up of some chronic back pain. Is that a coincidence that Adam really needs to be out the week that he had previously requested for vacation? You might assume that it is, but what we need to do here is take some steps to find out what's really going on before we, uh, before we respond to Adam. First of all, we're going to ask him about the leave, right? He says that he needs it for uh, chronic back pain flare-up, but we're not going to take him at his word. We're going to ask him about it, and we're going to require him to fill out the initial request for FMLA leave. He, note that in our scenario, he hasn't mentioned FMLA. He just says he needs to be out for chronic back pain. It doesn't mean that we're not required to give him FMLA leave. Just because he didn't use those magic words of, or those magic letters, FMLA, we know this is an FMLA qualifying event, potentially. So we ask him about the leave, provide him with our initial paperwork that, that, where he requests the leave. Why is that important? Well, the, the leave request form, the employee has to fill it out in writing and sign it. And I think that that is one way that you can get an employee to sort of be, it, it's a lot harder for an employee in some instances to mislead or, um, or take advantage of FMLA leave when they have to actually go through the process of filling out those forms. The next step, of course, will be to require that medical certification from Adam's healthcare provider. Now, are we going to, you know, remember, Adam's request was on December 23rd. Are we really going to be able to get all this paperwork back from Adam's healthcare provider before the, lead, the need for the leave starts? In reality, probably not, and we have to give the employee 15 days to get that medical certification back. So this is a scenario where we may have to allow the leave at the time, but if we find out later there was no need for leave, then Adam will be subject to discipline. So what we're doing here is jumping through all the required hoops, getting that medical certification from his health care provider, saying that he really needs leave during this time period. Again, if Adam really is coincidentally trying to, to take off 
and, and making up this reason for, for the need for leave and saying he has back pain when he really just wants to take off between Christmas and New Year's, then going through this process is going to help us realize that. But we can't jump to conclusions. We have to go through this process and get that medical certification. We'll wait and see what the medical certification says, and if the doctor says he needs leave, then that helps us know what we need to do next. Another thing that you can consider doing, and this is not something you can do in response to Adam's request for leave, it's something that needs to be put in place beforehand, is to have a personal certification policy. This is a little different than the request for leave or the medical certification that comes from the health care provider. This would be a policy that you have as an employer for all absences, not just FMLA-related leave. Any employee absences have a policy where the employee has to submit a personal certification explaining what the need for the leave is and signing, and signing that document with his or her you know, signature and and actually putting that in writing that this is the need for my leave. This, again, is another way, just another step for an employee to have to commit to writing that he or she needs the leave for a specific reason. And it's something that you can use down the road if you find out that, it, that the employee really did not have the chronic back pain or whatever the serious health condition was. So, the final step, of course, depending on what the response is, what information we get from Adam, what information we get from the health care provider, is to discipline Adam if we have confirmed that there's been a violation of our rules. For example, if Adam is unable to provide the medical certification, and of course we'd have to give him 15 days and do a follow-up request for the certification, but if it turns out he did not need FMLA leave for chronic back pain, we can discipline him for taking that leave when he wasn't entitled to it. Do we want to go ahead and fire Adam at that stage? Um, maybe, maybe not. It depends on what else has gone on with Adam and in, in his career. But the appropriate discipline can be applied if, again, if you determine that he really did not need that leave and he was just trying to work the system and take off between Christmas and New Year's when he hadn't been entitled to it before. In most cases that I have seen like this, the employee comes up with some kind of a certification. He wouldn't have called in sick and said he needed the leave. If he didn't have some idea, he'd be able to provide a doctor's note of some type. But we have held his feet to the fire, made him jump through the hoops, and other employees will know then that you can't just call in sick. You, you have to provide the, the required information. And it may be, again, like I said, that you find out he didn't really need the leave, and then if that's the case, then you can take appropriate disciplinary action. 